Nga haui fa o te motu, tēnā rā tātou. Uh, kia mihi a rātou, kia mene atu ki te pō, te aho mai rā i te umu rangi nui, haere, haere, haere atu rā koutou. Kā te rā, kia tātou ngā urupa o rātou mā, ngā waihotanga mai kei te mihi. Ko ngā whakaro, kei ngā whānau, uh, kei ngā hoa, ko pakia kaha nei ki te au peihanga tanga o te mate karauna, uh, kia tuaitia, te kōrero, kia kaha, kia maia, kia manua nui tātou. Ki te mana whenua, te atiawa, taranaki whānui nō tātou te whenua, e tuai te whare nei, i runga i te kaupapa o te rā, ka mahara, ki te mamai, ka rongo tonu, i te ngauko o te whenua, i te ngārue o te moana, ka nui te mihi kia koutou, kei akuranga tira. Uh, kei ngā manuhiri, uh, no mai uh, whakatau mai rā. Uh, it's an honour uh, to be with you here today, and my apologies for running uh, a little bit late. Um, I'd like to welcome you all again to this very important kaupapa. It gives us an opportunity to explore events in our nation's history that have helped shape uh, who we are today. Um, I want to give a special welcome to Wellington Girls College, uh, who are here today. No uh, mai haere mai. And I'd especially like to welcome and thank our speakers for being here. I'm excited to hear from uh, you both, Leah and Zach, about your experiences uh, championing opportunities for our nation to learn about and remember a significant part of our history. Um, I'm the Deputy Chief Executive Enterprise Partnerships. Uh, my name's Hwani Lambert and I'm from Wairo um, originally. Um, part of my role is to work in partnership with the National Librarian Rachel Essen. Just like to acknowledge Rachel. Wave Rachel is here today. Uh, and our Chief Archivist, um, Stephen Clark. I don't think Stephen's here today, but um, I'm sure he is in spirit. And together, uh, we've had a number of opportunities to engage with iwi, hapu, whānau and communities across Aotearoa uh, to learn about them and understand their culture and heritage aspirations for the future. One thing that has become clear through these conversations is that who tells the stories of the past is often not fully equitable. For many years, the story of our history has been told from one perspective and we have missed opportunities to learn about histories that are reflective of our nation's unique and rich cultural heritage. In my opening mihi, I acknowledge the very wars that happened in the Rohe we are standing in today, uh, wars that saw the significant loss of life and land for Te Atiawa, but have yet to be shared and told in a way that is authentic to them. Over the last few months, I've been working with other Deputy Chief Executives from across the government to develop an initiative that seeks to support our communities to tell their own local history. At the National Library and Archives, um, we have a large amount of knowledge, expertise, collections, taonga and mātauranga that can be shared throughout the country and used to support local stories and learning experiences for tamariki and rangatahi. Um, a significant driver of this initiative is enabling communities to tell their stories in their own way to ensure that future generations of tamariki and rangatahi are not missing opportunities to learn about who they are in a more inclusive way. I'm hoping that this initiative will begin to better support tamariki and rangatahi to build a, sen a strong sense of identity, create their own stories that can be continuously built upon and challenge the way our nation tells its history. I believe that a society that understands its history and shares stories of the past will be more vibrant, accepting and resilient. That is why I'm excited about the opportunity today to learn and hear from two incredible rangatahi who have been a driving force for the national remembrance of an important part of our history and for this history to be taught to all tamariki and rangatahi. I'd like to finish my kōrero today with a part of an oriori or lullaby uh, from my iwi Ngāti Kahunganu. Pene Pene Te Kura. Ori Ori were composed and recited to both impart iwi knowledge to tamariki and prepare tamariki to acquire iwi knowledge for future generations. And I wanted to leave you with this part of Pene Pene Te Kura as it not only tells a story of significant whakapapa, 
and how important that is in knowing who you are, but encourages you to continue to succeed and achieve great deeds. Whakakake e tama i te kinga o te waha. Nō runga rawa koe nō te tahu nui i a rangi i tū nei, nā rangi tū koe, nā rangi roa, nā tāne rawa, rawa koe. Ascend upwards, O sun, with a full mouth. You are of the highest from the apex of the sky above. You are of the sky above, the far-reaching sky. You are of Tāne himself. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā koutou katoa. I was meant to also open with a karakia, um, which I haven't done yet, so I'm going to do that first. Is that all right? And uh, then we'll do my waiata after that. Okay. Uh, he inoi tātou, um, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai. E hi aki ana, te atākura, he tio, he hoka, he hauhu, tihei mauri ora. Kia ora everyone. Thank you, Hoani, for this welcome. No my haere mai ki te puna mātou ranga o Aotearoa. I might take this off now. I welcome you all to the E Oho Waitangi Series 2021. And we've missed a few talks because of the COVID lockdown, but I'm glad that we can gather again, even though under different circumstances. My name is Dr. Tanya schubert MacArthur. I'm a learning facilitator here at the National Library and part of my role is to organize this amazing series. Thank you to everyone who is here today and a very warm welcome to Wellington Girls College students and teachers. I'd also like to announce two other events that are coming up in this very venue. So on 28th of October, the day that Hifakaputanga, the Declaration of Independence was signed, we have Carvin Jones give a talk about Hifakaputanga and Hipuapua and that happens at 5.30 p.m. Please um, RSVP if you want to come. And on the 5th of November at 12.10, we remember the 1881 invasion on Parihaka. And Rua Kere Hond will speak about Parihaka today. So again, you're welcome to attend, but please RSVP. We will continue to provide a safe space for robust discussion with today's talk. And it's wonderful to have two young people um, here who can tell us about their contribution to make change and change the course of history for New Zealand. So I'm very excited. So how it will work is that we have Leah Bell here in person and Zach Henry, who lives in the Waikato, will be zoomed in. And um, then we will have a conversation we will give you an opportunity to ask questions. If you'd like to do so, please raise your hand, speak loudly. This event is recorded. Um, we'll do our best to repeat the question through the mic because we can't pass it around. And I understand that Wellington girls students will need to leave at some stage. So if the teacher could just wave the hand when it's time to do so, 
and we'll pause for a little bit to give you a minute to um, to leave. But before you leave, we'd like to finish with Katakia. So just a, a hand up when you're close to departing. That's all for me. Please put your hands together for Leah Bell and Sig Henry. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, it's lovely to see you all here today. Um, as Tani said, I'm Leah Bell and I'm from Waitomo and I went to Ōtoruhanga College. Um, it's There's a lot of you <laughs> for social distancing, so beware me, beware, um, bear with me if I'm a little bit nervous. Um, and I'm a bit sad that I don't have my fellow Kai Petihana and friend, Zach Henry, with me in person, but it's wonderful that he can be here. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm very excited to speak to you guys. Um, as Leah said, my name is Zach Henry. Um, I also hail from within the King Country, from a small town called Ōtorohanga. Um, currently now living in lockdown level three in Hamilton. Uh, <laughs> so unable to attend uh, the event. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you for being here in person or on the Zoom. So we have heard that you were still at high school when you submitted a petition to parliament. I would like to hear more about um, how you did this and um, what motivated you. But first of all, how old were you? So I was 14 years old and Waimarama, who's not here today, sadly, who is also the co-signatory to the petition to commemorate the New Zealand Land Wars as a statutory day of remembrance. Very long. You can tell we didn't write that at 14. Um, so I was 14 and Waimarama was 16. Um, and Zach, who also came as part of the Ropu, we went as a, a, as a large school group to Rangiaofia and Orako, the battle sites near our, um, near our kura. How old were you, Zach? Uh, I think I was 17 at the time. 17, yeah. So I guess to talk a little bit about what inspired us and where this all started, um, I realised as as I've got older and as we've all got older that the beginning is far earlier than that moment when we did walk on the battle sites and hear from the Komatua and the Kuya who shared really their Tupuna's experiences um, and I guess wept with the with the mamai and with the lack of apology given, especially at a place like Rangiaofia. Um, and to explain to perhaps some of our rangatahi or um, our members here, if you don't know what happened at Rangiaofia, you can read Vincent O'Malley's book, who's, who's in the crowd here. Um, he's written about the Waikato War and um, the New Zealand Wars. Um, it's a great resource. Um, but what happened at Rangiaofia was essentially, it's a bit, you can't really call it a battle. It was more of an invasion, an invasion of a space that was supposed to be a sanctuary. And it was where um, elders and tamariki were, um, I guess, to the side of the battles that were happening and the crown came and awfully um, chased many from their homes and burnt people in churches and it's very horrible and I think that's something that we should probably be aware of in this discussion is that we will talk about these battles and the happenings of the New Zealand wars and if that's too much for you um, it's important that we talk about it and acknowledge it but understand if you can't take it on or need to have a breather but I guess the inspiration came from that moment of being there at the battle sites with the dirt covering our feet with all of our mates all around us feeling I guess a lot of shame about the fact that we didn't know what happened and horror, horror that it had happened and the feeling that it shouldn't be up for up to our comats were to carry that heavy, heavy weight anymore and that we have the opportunity to 
do something and say something. And that wasn't necessarily a petition to the government to face up to this fact and create a day of remembrance so we can all remember what happened um, in the 1860s, 1870s. Um, it was more so, we were more so thinking, what should we do at our school? Because Otorahanga College is only um, about half an hour away from these battle sites, and we thought, well, a lot of us here actually have ancestors that were in these battles, because Otorahanga was a place that a lot of people fled to as well. Um, and why don't we do something? And then somehow, when Marma and I were discussing it, and then somehow they just we ended up petitioning parliaments um, as you know, two people two young people from a very rural, low decile school who didn't really know what we were doing, but we had a lot of a lot of support from the Kingi Tanga and Uncle Tom, Tom Roa, um, and a lot of a lot of people offering us and helping us. But I think why I say it began far, you know, far be- beyond this moment was, you know, it was never our, our being there was not unintentional and it was organised by school, you know, my mum, if I'm going to be honest, it was organised by my mum who was a school teacher and I'd, I'd grown up with her who, and she was a, she was a treaty worker to use an old, an old um, term and I'd grown up with Nga Tamatoa members, Mariana Pittman around me and um, when I was driving to school, that was what mum was t- telling me stories about Reverend Volkner, you know, and Kiri Opetero and what happened and colonisation, just a really light topic for a four-year-old <laughs> to hear. And Waimarama, her, her nan, Auntie Josephine Anderson, she, you know, she laid down, she, she submitted to the tribunal, the Waitangi Tribunal, which was, I think was the first or one of the first um, submissions, claims made um, for Waitomo, which was taken in um, um, through the Scenery Preservation Act, the, the Taonga and the caves away from Mana Whenua. And so we'd been brought up and, you know, Zach can speak for himself and his upbringing for sure in a second, but we had been brought up in kind of quite, you know, strong, biculturally aware um, environments, both of us and a lot of us in our school and in our kura growing up in Otorahanga where the kind of the lines between peoples blur quite a lot. So, and we'd also, you know, there, we'd seen a lot of injustices and a lot of, um, I guess, discrimination within the education and school system um, to our to Māori friends um, in terms of the streaming and what happened there. And why Marama and I went to primary school together um, and she was treated, my, myself as a Pākehā person, she was treated very, very, very differently by the teachers and we were kept inside because we ended up screaming at the teachers for how, how they were treating her and how they were disrespecting her and had very different standards for how they treated why versus myself um, and other Māori students in our class, to be honest. So we came into this inspired by what, inspired I guess driven it's not inspiration is not really the word that sounds like it's something um and um, well, it doesn't it doesn't exactly encompass the feeling of when you are moved to do something because of injustice and because of mamai really it's a it's a different sort of force but we'd come into it I guess with a long a long history of growing up in a rural area where we'd seen I guess the the effects of the New Zealand wars in that it separated people and created different values for people due to the lack of, um, due to really, I guess, the knowledges that were lost and the the, um, discrimination that stemmed a lot from the wars existed in our own lives growing up in Waitomo. That's a long-winded answer, but Zach, I don't know, what did, you, how did you come on to this, to this kopapa? Do you remember? So my um, my great great grandfather was Wahanui Huatari, who was a um, was a primary chief of Maniopoto. Um, so I've 
from day dot, I've always heard of stories regarding um, the wars that he had fought um, and uh, the various other skirmishes that happened um, to the Zorako um, Rangiriri. Um, and when I heard Leah and Waimaramo were doing a petition, I thought, personally, I thought, wow, this isn't, this is like a really good idea. And why hasn't this happened like in the time of my tupuna? Um, my grandfather, who at the time was also going through the tribunal hearings um, with matters regarding Maniopoto land. Um, and I just thought, well, if two young rangatahi women can um, come up with this, how far can we take this? And here we are today. And, and Zach, for you um, growing up, in a Māori environment, were you told those stories by your your family? Uh, this, they the elders picked and choose who they would tell specific stories to, such as um, regarding the walls or um, how uh, maybe Tupuna were treated from the Pakia. Um, I was fortunately. Uh, fortunate enough to be one of those little kids that were able to hear those stories surrounded by my komatu on the paipai um, and growing up you know from kindergarten to uh, primary to college I was sort of null to those stories because I've heard them you know months and months and years and years prior to this petition um, coming into fruition, so um, yeah, was was widely talked about with within my own family, on my own rise. Thank you, and it's great. <laughs> um, so, doing tours of Hetohu, our exhibition upstairs, we often find that um, members of the public aren't informed very well about New Zealand history and that there's a, a real gap um, that needs to be addressed. So can you talk a bit about um, what your petition tried to achieve there and perhaps the, the consequences that have come out of that? Um, shall we start with you? Sure. So when we started petitioning, it was really just to create a conversation within our own community and it burgeoned into, you can use that word guys in your NCA exams, burgeoned is a great word, but it burgeoned into a, um, a nationwide kind of petition. And really we, we did have the aim to have a public holiday that commemorated the New Zealand wars. That was a space and it was a day where we could remember that people could be allowed to grieve, people could be allowed to um, engage safely with this, with this history in a way that they haven't been able to before. But honestly, it was just about having a conversation. So we didn't really care if it was negative at the start with people saying, why should we care about this history? What does it mean? Um, and, you know, why are we wasting our time with this? Um, we didn't, that was, that was okay. And that was fine because it was something. And it was, it was more, um, it had more potential than the silence that we were up against before where people just, there was just, you know, it, people were too afraid if you were Parker, especially to engage with this history, because what does that mean for your identity and for your privilege? Um, and what, how have you benefited off um, the oppression of other people? You know, that's, that's a hard thing for people to face up to. And that did mean that there were some responses from people, you know, just not wanting to engage at all and didn't want us to support the petition. But yeah, we, we were okay with that. Um, so what was the question about consequences of the petition? Okay, so we, we took it through Parliament in 2015 and we were sponsored by Nana, the Honourable Nanaya Mahuta um, and we had so the support of the Kingitanga, um, Iwi Chairs Forum. Um, we had actually cross-party support across, um, yeah, 
across all of Parliament. So we had Nas- the National Party, um, Maori Party, um, NZ First, Greens, all came together to support us. And I really think that was because we were young people and we were nonpartisan. So if there are any young activists in the crowd right now, that is some advice that we can give you is don't, I'm not saying don't care about who supports you because it's about the Kaupapa, but don't worry, don't, um, I guess, privilege help over other help. So feel free to get on board anyone you can with your Kaupapa because that's really the way that you can push stuff through Parliament is by having an open mind and being really inclusive of all peoples. Um, And so we pushed it through Parliament and then we sat in front of the select committee, um, the Māori Affairs Select Committee that is, and they decided that there would be a $4 million putia put aside to commemorate the New Zealand wars um, every year. And we didn't get a public holiday, even though before Labour got in, they did say they would make it a public holiday, but they haven't, so I don't know. Um, so what happened was uh, the day of commemoration, Ramo Mahara, um became a really large event happening every year called Te Pū Taki o Tiriri, where a certain region around the country would hold large commemorations for the New Zealand wars based around the wars in the area. So the first year, it was at Kororareka um, up north in Te Tai Tokiro, and that was a massive, massive event. Um, and we went around Rua Pika Pika and all the battle sites there, um, and everyone is welcome, everyone from the public. We all share hākari and we all have quartered on discussions about identity and about this history. Um, and there's, you know, documentaries and art and um, tamariki perform and things. And when we first went to Kororareka, it was really overwhelming because, you know, when we were just 14, we couldn't envision what it would be like to have, you know, I guess thousands of people come together to acknowledge and engage with this history in a meaningful way. And then it went through uh, Waitara, which was incredible. But sadly, over the last two years, the Pūtaki Otiriri has been cancelled due to COVID-19. And we were supposed to have it this year in Waikato on the 28th of October, which is the commemoration day. Um, but that has, yeah, sadly been postponed till next year. But um yeah, if, if when it's on next year, we invite all of you to come and engage with this history. Yeah. And uh, Sek, would you like to talk us through what happens at a commemoration day and how it feels to attend? The first day, especially for us being Kaipetihana, is the most nerve-wracking thing. Um, we don't know how the crowds will interact with us and how they'll take us. And um, I think... Uh, when we attended Kororareka, it was, um, I don't know, the feeling was um, hair-raising. We had goosebumps when we attended. Um, they they brought all the stops out. Um, and the main focus of um, many of these commemorations is um, rangatahi, um, getting youth into uh, speaking about the wars, um, you know, commemorating uh, these wars right, um, not just a, a day off school, um, but to actually appreciate um, what our tupuna went through. Um, I can't speak for Waitara, um, that was Leah and Thais, but um, Kororareka was um, goosebumps. I can imagine. Now, um, looking at the time, I'd like to open up for questions, and um, especially from Rangatahi. So if you have a question, please put your hand up and speak loudly. Don't be shy. <laughs> Is there anyone who... Cool, that was a really great question. So I'll just repeat that. So what was your name? Sorry, Han? 
Hi. Um, so the question was, uh, how can we best learn about um, New Zealand history uh, in a, um, when it's not often talked about in sort of areas and is that the kind of question? So the great thing about the new curriculum, which was a, um, a clause of our petition was to have education in schools about the New Zealand wars in particular, but wonderfully, um, the new government has pushed through for 2022 to have history in schools taught, New Zealand history that is. And the great thing about it is that it is focused on local histories. So I think the first thing to think about when engaging with um, the history of Aotearoa is to realise that it's all around you and it's in every experience that you have, this history, these untold stories. And so that means... I mean, this, this is quite, I guess, complicated, but it's realizing, it's asking questions of yourself. Like, how did these roads, how were these roads built that I walk on every day to school? And if you think of Tinakori Road or Tinakori Road, that came, that name came about, um, which I was told by Ko Matua from um, Māori who were forced to build that road. They weren't given any dinner. Tina being dinner and kore being none. And it's having that, I guess, that consciousness that the stories you've been told have been built for a purpose and that the myth-making that we have around our country about being a place of racial harmony, um, you know, you have to question that and question what you know. So start there, question what you know, question who are the names, who are the, what are the, the names on the streets, what does it mean? Who were they? Why are we remembering their names over other people's names? Um, asking, asking those questions, thinking about the whenua that your school is on, what happened there? Um, in terms of resources, this is, uh, I would totally recommend for school students as well to use Tiara and even the government's website, the New Zealand History you know, government website is actually pretty good. Um, a really great way to engage with this history is something that I'm working on in my work at Bridget Williams Books, and it's called the Tangata Whenua Stories Project, and hopefully soon to be women's, women's stories too, um, where we have converted from this um, incredible resource, which I would suggest you all check out, called Tangata Whenua, an illustrated history, this puka puka, um, where a whole lot of stories have been written. Um, that are made really accessibly um, accessible. Sorry for for high school students, and you can access that through your library. So there, you can definitely use books, but also go onto YouTube. There are documentaries. Be, be careful with what you watch. But RNZ does really great documentaries. But with Vincent O'Malley again, with Mihingarangi Forbes, um, that are good snapshots for how to engage with this history. But really, just to go back to what I was saying at the start, which is it's about understanding that you have a cultural identity and that might be radical for Pākehā students, but it's really, it's understanding that you have an identity and that you have history and that you have had a role and your whānau have had a role here in Aotearoa. And we often live quite disconnected as Pākehā, but it's really important that you consider how you came to be and your role here and your responsibilities when you engage with this history. Because, you know, time and time again, we have heard mayors and councillors and things talk about um, New Zealand history, especially in Taranaki, for example, discussing, you know, really heavy things like sexual assault that happened to Māori women at Parihaka and saying very nonchalantly, and we have to we have to remember that it's 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 real and it's living here and that the effects of the New Zealand wars exist in your body and exist for many people in very visceral ways. And the money you have in the legacy of your whānau um, being involved in the justice system, um, where, you, where you are placed in school, in your streaming, um, in the health system right now with COVID-19, who are our most vulnerable? Why are they most vulnerable? Why, you know, um, it's understanding that it's very real 
And it's not, you know, they're not just stories. It's something that affects us every day. So I guess it just begins with looking at your own life, looking at where you live and starting from there. I hope that answers your question. Zach, do you have anything to add to that one? No, Leah answered it perfectly. <laughs> so it's time for another question. Thank you. So the question was, Zach, um, how much New Zealand history were we taught in schools in school in comparison to like American history, for example? Do you want to? answer that question um so i took history from year 10 right up to year 13 while i was at otrohanga college um it wasn't until my final year as a year 13 that i could choose my own subject to um, focus um, all of my studies on and i chose the new zealand land wars and the kingitanga um so right up until that point um it was the, um, from year 10 to year 13, it was the Russian Revolution. Um, and it was the women's suffrage um, movement. And there was nothing um, regarding the New Zealand land wars um, until I chose it myself. Um, and that was mainly because it was embedded into what teachers had to learn um, or teach children. So, wasn't up until year 13 when I got the chance. Thank you, Zach. Onohia, onohia, onohia ki te uru taponui. Kia wātea, kia māma, te nākau, te tinana, te wairua i te ara takatu. Koia rā e rongo, aka iria, a kikironga, kia tina, tina, huie, tai kie. And we continue with a question at the front. Zach, what are you doing now? <laughs> Career-wise, is that? Yeah. Yes. Are you on mute, I think? <laughs> yeah, here we are. <laughs> Nothing at the moment. Not with this lockdown. Moho, moho ao. I'll just say that, you know, that Zach is a historian in his own right, absolutely, of Maniapoto. Um, and, you know, it's been such a, you know, he's been such a vital part of the Kaipitihana team. Um, and, yeah, we're, I hope I hope that we can grow old together and you can share your knowledge with us and the Kaipitihana team forever, Zach. So we're really grateful for Everything that you do, always. Very, very hyping. <laughs> <laughs> and you're living the good life. He was chasing a, a chicken <laughs> before we started the tour. It's still out. I, I, I didn't catch it. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes. So the question was, what is what was the resistance to making Rama Mahara the Day of Remembrance um, a public holiday? Um, it's, it's interesting because we were pushing for a public holiday initially. And then once we had the, the statutory day of commemorance, I did understand some of the perspectives that were saying they're worried that it would become, I guess, similar to Waitangi Day and that it would just be, you know, uh, commercialized and not that it's like that everywhere, um, in for Waitangi Day, but there'd be sales and whatnot like that. Um, and I did, I did hear that. I guess the public, the public holiday idea that we had was, it would be you know a day that people and workers in particular can spend time with their Fano to engage with this history. Um, I'm not sure on the government's particular resistance to making it a public holiday. I know when they were asked again. Recently, if they would make it a public holiday, they said, oh, but we're making Matariki a public holiday, so we won't make this a public holiday. The under, yeah. So, yeah, Zach, do you have a perspective on this? Um, 
Um, I know from within iwi, uh, especially here in Waikato, there were uh, there were two sides. Obviously, the the ones who I went up to, they and I talked and I talked and I talked, um, and their final answer to that would be, "Waihoti arata kia moe. let them sleep." Um, kia kawe parura haere ngā rātou ne waka, so, they, so their sleep doesn't get disturbed by what we were trying to achieve, which um, I, I understood because they had fought the war, um, they had been through the struggles, and then there was this other side of, yes, it should be, so we could all come together and um, remember those who had gone. Um, but the, the resistance to making it a day um, yeah, that's, I guess that's the million dollar question is why we don't have one. Um, but I'm sure one day, hopefully, one can be, one day can be turned around such as the Queen's birthday. I ain't personal opinion. <laughs> Tell them that. Um, I think Jacinda also said um, that you know, it was after because she announced the history uh, curriculum when the New Zealand Wars pl plaque was unveiled in the debating chamber. Um, and she was asked, not by me, but she was asked by um, the media, uh, why isn't there a public holiday? And she said, oh, you know, we're, the priority is, is the curriculum. And I do understand. I do understand that. Um, but I think I, I still have hope that one day there might be a bit more of an, a national holiday because um, or a national day of remembrance because at the moment it's still quite regional and moving around every year. Um, and I think we hope that there will be a, a be more engagement. And I think something I do want to acknowledge is that it was quite it was quite hard to hear when the wonderful race relations commissioner Ming Foon started his job. He was saying we must have a national commemoration day for the New Zealand wars, and we were like, oh, but didn't we just do that? And we're like, oh man, has it had has it had the outreach that we really want? Um, but I think in getting education in schools in particular, um, how it how the movement that we were a part of and the other um, happenings at the time with the repatriation of of battle sites, um, which is still yet to properly happen at, at Orako, um, and you know the apology, um, the pardoning of Rua Kinana, and all these things that have happened over the past seven years in terms of awareness um, and addressing of our history. I think it will continue to unfold and. I, I, everyone puts that puts the weight on 2040 is what, what who will we be who who will we be what will we look like what, how much um, knowledge and will our tamariki have and will children have of of each other and of our past and of our history and of our wrongs and of our rights so yeah I guess that while we don't have a public holiday you know we never thought that there would be education in schools because the Ministry of Education would just say the same thing to us, which was, "We won't, um, we won't take away a school's autonomy," is what they would say. And I, ugh, you know, this, you can unpack that in a lot of different ways. What the Ministry of Education me meant by that, but you know, we saw it as basically saying, "You're saying that we're not important, and that our history isn't important, and that our cultural identity as peoples isn't important." by this word autonomy. So amazingly, we I mean, I was very surprised and I think a lot of people were incredibly surprised that um, schools started, that uh, the government decided to make it compulsory to have our history taught in schools. And I think there were a lot of different reasons and push for that. And again, addressing Vincent, he put something up on Twitter recently of 90, in 1992, a young student young Māori student um, wrote to the Waitangi, made a claim to the Waitangi Tribunal, wrote to the Waitangi Tribunal and said, why am I not knowing my own history? Why is it not being taught in schools? Why am I not being seen? And I think 
that's a huge thing why we really did what we did because we came from, you know, a really pretty hard done by school where, where media would just trash us time and time again. Um, and people would write into the newspaper about us as young people and say things like, oh, you know, you know, rat bags, <laughs> they use different terms. but um, And it was that thing of really wanting to be seen and wanting the anger and frustration that so many people have in areas that have been shaped by the land wars to have that be validated and have that be understood and have teachers have a, um, a consciousness of that history and how it's influenced the students in their classroom. So, yeah, we don't know how it will, will unfold, but I think it's a great starting point. Yeah. So the question was, where did you circulate the petition? How did you get people on board? And the reaction to the petition. So our first um, petitioning point was outside the warehouse here in Hamilton, um, in the city centre. Um, and that was a good point where um, two streets meet and that's where a lot of foot traffic was. Um, and so we talked uh, to people passing by. Some people would think that we were selling something, so they would brush us off and keep walking. Um, but those who did stop, um, those who both thought negatively and positively about this petition, um, stopped and talked to us. Um, and uh, after like a five minute conversation with those who thought negative about the petition, uh, we slowly persuade them onto our side to see the, the, uh, the reasoning and why we were doing this petition. Um, another point was going to uh, conferences. Um, I took the petition to the Māori Women's Welfare League National Conference in, um, I think it was Tauranga that year. Um, Leah and um, other students took the petition to the Kafia Kai Fest. Um, where they gathered um, thousands of signatures from um, people who attended that event. Um, but a lot was on the street, face-to-face um, -face with people. Um, you could be walking uh, to the warehouse at the base, and there we were um, in our little corner petitioning to, to people. So, yeah, it was at a various... Um, um, I forget the places where Leah took it. Um, the petition. You took it to quite a few events. Um, I didn't go to this one, but we took it to Polyfest as well. We kind of went to every big event that we could go to. We also went to the regatta at Tūranga Waiwai, the Waka Ama um, competition. Um, so, yeah, we went, we went everywhere. But it was interesting because – we didn't really get that much traction online with our online petition. We had you know, changed our org petition. I think we got maybe a thousand or like eight hundred. Zach was in charge of all that, um, and it just people needed to have that conversation, and then needed especially to be assured that it wasn't punitive, and that they wouldn't be made to feel wrong for their lack of knowledge or you know, in some cases specifically for what their ancestors did. Um, and so, you know, we had a lot of conversations that were quite long having to like assure people and be really gentle and just let people speak. It wasn't us speaking at people half the time. It was them talking to us and telling us about how they feel, about who they are and where they've come from and whether we should remember or not and whether it's too painful for them or not. So those are big and often quite heavy conversations. Um, yeah, and man, we certainly had a lot of different ones outside the warehouse in particular. Um, but yeah, we're, you know, we're really grateful to all the organisations that let us um, petition and um, especially the Kingi Tanga, so supportive. But I think just to highlight one place that we got signatures from because we sent we sent our petition out to every single high school in Aotearoa. So I would have liked to say that too, the Wellington girls. But um, And hardly any came back. But 
the school group that did and were consistently supportive of us with a young was a young mother's unit in Wellington and that you know we think about them a lot and what it meant for them to show up immediately and support us and I think about their life stories and how they got into the place that you know to be in that unit and when you start this journey of understanding our history and the layers between womanhood and and war and um, privilege, you understand that, you know, when we when we begin to explore the origins of national stories, of personal stories, um, I guess it it opens up your ability to share your own in many ways. And that was I don't know, I felt like we were we were sharing, you know, something quite vulnerable in them in them signing signing the petition and being so supportive. It was kind of like a meeting of people who desired desired to be honest and truthful and yeah I just I I think about that that group of young women a lot and how um, courageous they were to support us um, when we didn't have a lot of support yeah right I'm going to get my postgraduate history hat on for this question so um, Zach the question was um, to talk about the curriculum what can we how can we speak on that um and a historio a historiographical question about how we the nation state how we became how we moved from how does the new zealand wars help us understand uh, historiographically why we have why histories were based on the nation state was can would you mind repeating your question maybe we have to ask two different questions there <laughs> Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So, how is is this topic kind of uh, is New Zealand history and how the New Zealand wars in particular, Zach, um, destabilizing to um, kind of the the idea of New Zealand's search for security? Anyway, okay. So, first thing on the, the curriculum, I might let you talk to this soon in a second, Zach. Is that I can't speak very specifically to it. I have been part kind of on and off of a group called Te Ohu Matua, which reviews the curriculum for the Ministry of Education. Um, it's pretty, it was, it's been pretty dense and uh, kind of pathway focused that I haven't been able to speak to it much because I'm not an educator. Um, but I will say is that there are really great people involved working on it. Um, Aroha Harris particularly has been involved in writing it um and you know the royal society have written a report on their views um so i definitely you can look that up online that's been published um i think it's definitely focused on local based histories and there's kind of five core areas that they're looking at um and a lot on kind of migration stories uh um, how you know how people came to be in the New Zealand Wars, the twentieth century. Um, so you can you can look up the specifics of that online. I guess I could say we could maybe express our key hopes and key concerns, Zach. So I'll say that my my you know I, I'm actually really hopeful about this because I know people are like, oh God, it could be terrible teaching this in schools, especially with teachers who haven't engaged with this material at all and that's why it's so difficult and I think that's why we haven't had education before particularly in Aotearoa is it's not like teaching the Russian revolution there are there are direct consequences for the students in your classes um, from from these wars and from from this history Uh, and it's uncomfortable it's deeply uncomfortable to talk about especially you know where we grew up in Otorohanga and in Waitomo because people are we had a teacher talking to us um, about the caves and the history of the caves. And she was completely leaving out the fact that um, they were taken in the Scenery Preservation Act and that um, all the kids who their, their parents are cave guides get paid a pittance. And 
um, there are direct reasons for that. You know, it's it's really uncomfortable in many ways to talk about this history. So I really hope that we can support teachers to feel comfortable to do this and that we pr- provide good resourcing. And I think that is happening, um, good resourcing for that. I think my key concerns for this are definitely, it's not that it's not students' ability ability to engage with this history. We've seen that time and time again in this movement. Um, 700 school students from mainstream schools came together in a kawenata with, um, with the kingitanga and performed at the koronehana, at the coronation, where they'd learnt kapaka and they'd learnt waiata, um, all about the history, all about the New Zealand wars, all about what happened. And it was so fierce and so in terms of the, the wairua, it was so profound watching all these students come together and they were so excited to be able to share share this history and share what they'd learned and everything. I was, you know, in that moment, I lost any any apprehension that I had about young people's abilities to learn this history. It's really, I'm concerned about parents and teacher teachers. So I think perhaps if there's there could almost be like a support network or workshops for teachers. I think that's what really needs to happen because I was, when at school, I was, you know, told the awful myths about Moriori as an 11 year old. And this was in 2010, you know, so a whole lot of, a whole lot of teachers, unfortunately, are still living and breathing really harmful national myths. Um, So that will have to be unpacked and they will have to confront themselves in a way. So that's where the difficulty lies, in my opinion. What are your thoughts on the curriculum, Zach? <laughs> Sorry, Tanya, I'm taking over moderating. <laughs> yeah. I think you've answered that question perfectly. Yeah, teaching the teachers um, with the resources aren't there, then how can um, it be taught properly, truthfully, and non biased? Yeah, I think you've done a beautiful job. And Zach, do you think teaching New Zealand history, including the New Zealand wars, will help to maybe um, have better relations between Māori and non-Māori, or is it destabilising and potentially um, dividing? I think it'll um, break that wall of weariness, whether to talk about it or not to talk about it. Um, you know, as Leah said before. Um, people can get really tiptoey around the subject of the New Zealand land wars and uh, especially um, being, uh, I'm going to use the phrase again, um, those of Pākehā descent, European descent, um, a touchy subject for them um, when words such as colonialists, white colonialists come out, um, which it will um, regarding the subject of the New Zealand land wars, um, the fear of awkwardness. And I suppose talking about things like the New Zealand land wars will normalise how we see each other as um, a nation and New Zealanders, Maoris, Europeans, breaking the boundary. Really well said. And um, sitting here as a, a person of German descent, I can also say that um, in Germany, the Holocaust is part of the curriculum and we do field trips to concentration camps. And it's actually the, the view is that you need to learn about your past because then you will avoid repeating the past and making the same mistakes. So I'm, I'm hopeful for the new Aotearoa's history's curriculum. So maybe just a chance to um, do a final statement. And um, Leah, I start with you. Is there anything that um, you're still hopeful for the future and in terms of the petition um, really fulfilling what you set out to do? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm very hopeful for the future in many ways. I see young people learning and taking on this history and I, I feel I feel fully optimistic. I think in terms of what I would love to see, I would love um, to have our government be more informed about our history and make um, choices around housing and healthcare and social justice based on our history. 
Um, because, you know, when we were petitioning, it was the same time that John Key and see New Zealand was one of the only countries that was settled peacefully. And we were just like far out, you know, how, how is our prime minister saying that? And so I'm really glad that Jacinda has decided to um, have, have our histories taught in schools. But I think that's really, really what I hope for is that policies are based on this history because it's, it's direct. The correlation is direct to, um, to this history. And I think especially right now in terms of what we're going through in the COVID-19 pandemic, I could go on on a really long tangent about why it's important that we understand our history in terms of the policies and decisions that are being made now. And we're living in a time of deep fear, um, especially what will happen to our Māori whānau with vaccination and things. And I think it's so important for empathy. It's so, so important. Um, to understand why there is fear and why there is misinformation and all the different layers with that. And it comes from understanding our history. Um, so that would be a great, you know, top great um, session to have at some point. Um, but, I, yeah, I think that's empathy-based policies, history-based policies. Um, that's what I really hope for. And I just – the number one thing, really – is I hope students feel valued in the class and I hope they they feel seen by their teachers and they feel known. There's this great phrase that's going around at the moment which um, from a feminist writer that I love, Glennon Doyle, and she, she says, to, um, to be loved, you must be known. And I think that really applies to this history. And growing up in Wisemore, like a lot of our peers didn't feel known it didn't feel seen and were angry and frustrated and in the classroom and you know the curriculum and the way that they were treated it didn't apply to their life and it didn't apply to their values and so I hope that this history will create this uh, an awareness of this history will create understanding between people so we can be more informed and more empathetic yep that's my That's my point. Thank you. And Zach, what are your hopes for the future? They come in many, um, but my main one is um, from 2014 when we've started this petition right up until now, um, there has been this great ball rolling of people seeking knowledge uh, regarding the land wars, um, more and more people every year attending um, commemorations throughout New Zealand, um, whether it be on the 28th or the specific dates um, that those battles were fought in. Um, and I hope that that ball um, keeps on rolling um, and there um, is a more quarter or every year, uh, every month and every day, uh, normalising, uh, talking about the New Zealand land wars. Do not make it a, a ghost in the cupboard. Now we've come to the end of the session. I thank you very much for being here today. Um, amazing kōrero. So namihi nui kia kōrua. And thank you everyone who was here and contributed. See you again.